Coming up next, Ask the Governor. We're live statewide with Governor Chris Gregoire to take your questions about the state economy, the budget, gay marriage, and other issues. We're ready to take your questions by phone and online. Ask the Governor is next. Local production of Ask the Governor is made possible in part by First Choice Health. Proud to continue our ongoing support of Ask the Governor as a founding underwriter. At First Choice Health, we recognize that healthy employees make healthy companies. First Choice Health. Good evening, I'm Enrique Cerna, and welcome to Ask the Governor, a live, unrehearsed call-in show taking your questions for Governor Chris Gregoire. This program is being broadcast tonight on public television and radio stations statewide. We're also being carried by Northwest Public Radio throughout the state of Washington. In just a moment, we will open the phone lines to take your calls with questions for the governor. The number is 1-800-258-6463. Again, 1-800-258-6463. You can also submit a question online. You just go to kcts9.org slash governor, and you can follow the discussion online through Twitter. Hashtag Ask the Governor. Governor Gregoire is here to take questions tonight. And Governor, welcome. Um, a little bit of good news uh, came last week with the revenue forecast showing that uh, we were doing a bit better. Yes. Uh, also, up until that time, we had heard that uh, uh, not as many people were asking for state services. So a little bit of breathing room, I, I take it. No question about it. Uh, in, the, in the one area, it's about 333 million dollars uh, in the revenue uh, aspect of it it's almost a hundred million dollars so that's a good piece of news now what that means is we're recovering but I don't mean to suggest we're out of the woods by any stretch there we're still a fragile economy worried much about what's going on in Europe and what that could mean to us if there was a default Greece there. and gas prices right, right exactly but clearly in our state good signs of recovery uh, so I'm, I'm quite optimistic about our future and I'm glad the legislature's got some well-deserved good news uh, we're looking now at probably what, about $500 million that we have to cover in this budget hole? Well, about $500 million in actual additional cuts, but they really have to leave a reserve. Again, we're fragile, so at any given moment something can happen and trip us back. Uh, so we need to leave some reserve. I put in $600. Uh, I'm hoping they'll do something similar to that. So they've got about a billion to a billion point one. Uh, of a hole that they've got to really address over the next two and a half weeks. When we talk about the fact that not as many people have been using state services and that brought down the caseload numbers, are, are we really saying that also that's reflective of the fact that people have been cut from no using question. state services? No question. The one piece of it that's, uh, some of it is driven by policies that we put in place. Uh, the, those who are what we call um, unemployable people, singles, uh, we put in a lot of dramatic reform last legislative session. Many of them dropped from the rolls entirely uh, because they weren't going to get a cash grant anymore. So our rolls went down in terms of the housing and the medical assistance we were giving. For reasons I don't understand, our enrollment in our schools is down a little bit. So uh, maybe our predictions were wrong. So clearly it is the fact that we've made cuts. Uh, people have exhausted themselves have have gone someplace else living with family members um, they've looked at other means of, of subsistence if you will so the results of which is uh, 333 million dollars that now can be put back in to avoid even more draconian cuts but are those folks are then uh, counting on local government possibly local county government possibly. city governments to then help them out we don't really know we don't we do not know um, some of them, in fact, could have given up and gone homeless. Uh, I mean, that's just, if, if you look at that segment of the population that is single and unemployed, who more often than not have a drug or alcohol addiction, uh, they're not going to get a cash grant anymore. All, all they're entitled to is some housing assistance and medical care, and they have dropped completely from the rolls. It isn't as if they have any other source of income. So where have they gone? Have they found friends or family, or have they just gone homeless? That's kind of difficult to... Oh, it's just heart-wrenching. I mean, the cuts that we have had, we've, over the last three years, we've cut 
billion dollars. I, I, I know that's a staggering amount, but think of the people behind those cuts. Uh, we really have had to cut in areas we never would have anticipated. 46% in higher education, 26% in our community colleges and our K through 12 system, um, shredded our social safety net, uh, really hurt our fundamental responsibility of public safety. So I'm looking forward to recovery. Uh, not that we're gonna get all that back anytime soon, but as, if we could just right the ship and avoid any additional cuts, uh, we can begin to see a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm just curious, do you wake up every day wondering what's happening in Europe, uh, particularly yes. what's happening in Greece? Yes. Uh, I know that uh, we used to talk to uh, the uh, state economists uh, that he often pointed out to those things, that uh, things he couldn't control. I pay more attention to that every single day. When I wake up, I check and see what's exactly going on in Europe. I can tell you for the last how many ever years, I really wasn't paying that much attention. But now we are so linked economically, internationally, that you better pay attention. And uh, this state in particular, so for example, if there was an economic collapse in the Pacific Rim, the implications for us would be draconian immediately because we are so trade dependent. We're the most trade dependent in the entire country. And much of our trade goes to Korea, to Japan, to China. Um, so we, we really, as a state, have to be acutely aware of what's going on internationally. I want to take uh, an email question here. This is from uh, Linda in Chehalis. By your advocacy of the right of same-sex couples to marry, I would think that basic human rights are important to you. And then I must ask why that same effort isn't being put forth for teachers to have a living wage. If same-sex couples have the right to marry, then why can't teachers have the human right to pay the bills and put food on the table? So we have not been able to do the Initiative 732 COLA increases for teachers over the last three years. Uh, I was the first governor to be able to fully fund teacher pay increases, uh, which I was very proud of. So I'm no more disappointed than Linda is at the fact over the last three years we have not been able to do pay increases. But our choices were things like this, a pay increase for a teacher and no food for somebody or no housing for somebody. I mean, those were the absolute uh, terrible choices that we had to make. So I'm sympathetic. Uh, no question about it, to the fact that we've not been able to do pay raises. We've lost 10% of our state employment. Uh, we've watched as the private sector has gained employment, public sector has drowned that out by the amount of layoffs that we've had to make. Our people have taken um, mandatory days off. They've taken pay cuts. They've had to pay more for their health care, more for their pension. It's a tough time, no question about it. We need to hang on, get through the difficult time, because the, there's a brighter future for us. All right, uh, let's take a phone call here. I actually want to go to uh, line three here. Uh, we're going to go to Robert. He's in Walla Walla. Robert, you're on the air with the governor. Robert? Hi. Uh, what will you do to help support the nationwide movement to amend the Constitution to overturn the Citizens United Supreme Court decision? Can you do anything? Well, <laughs> uh, I can't override a Supreme Court decision. Uh, but I will tell you. You may want to. Yes, <laughs> I may want to. And we're talking about the election. Uh, and I think that that decision may be one of the worst decisions for elections in our country. I wonder, are we going to be able to have somebody run for president of the United States, who, States who's not wealthy, who's not dependent on totally wealthy people? I don't think this is a good sign for the country. Uh, I, I'm really very disturbed by what I'm seeing and and the kind of independent expenditures that are going out. Uh, this is not a comment on Republican or, or Democrat. It's a, a comment on the entire election system. So uh, the S Supreme Court's spoken, and it's really it's quite hard to overturn that, even through Congress. They can't just override that. There's, it's a First Amendment free speech exercise that's at play here when you put money into campaigns. So you've got to be very careful about it. So... I hope we can put some sideboards on it and get real integrity back into the election system so people can have confidence that every vote counts, not the one that's got the most money behind it, but every single individual. 
At least two Supreme Court justices recently said that they would like to see the court uh, revisit that issue. There's also a Montana case that uh, may go before the court as well, and it could uh, require them to revisit Citizens United, so it may not be done. Henry, I don't think the court understood the implications of the decision, and now that we've seen it, I would hope they'd revisit it themselves, yes. Let's take another phone call here. Uh, Stan in Linwood. Stan, you're on the air with Governor Gregoire. Go ahead, yes. Stan. Good evening, Governor Gregoire. I was wondering why you have to cut the uh, Medicaid B3 funding for clubhouses when you get the money from the federal government's Medicaid funds. So here's the problem that the legislature and I have confronted over the last three years. We often hear uh, the statement made, you can't cut something in Medicaid because we're a 50-50 match state. Uh, we put in 50 cents, the federal government puts in 50 cents. The problem with that is we didn't have the 50 cents, and we had to step up to the reality we didn't have it anymore. So I don't know what specific program you're talking about here, but if it was cut, it was cut only because the state didn't have the ability to put in our match to make it happen. Uh, I'm hopeful we're going to be able, now that we have some additional money on the table, to restore some of the cuts that I had to make last fall, my priority, to be honest with you, back to Linda, is education. Uh, it's not going to give her a COLA, but I hope it will restore some of the otherwise cuts that we'd have to make to K-12 through and higher education in particular. We didn't take cuts in uh, early learning, um, and we were awarded a $60 million grant because of the work we're doing there in a Race to the Top application. So uh, I hope we're going to be able to restore some of the cuts I had to make but I have to be honest, we can't restore them all. Even this amount of money, we've still got to make very difficult cuts after half, already having cut $10.5 billion. Let's talk about um, the budgets that have been produced by the House, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans. The House uh, Democrats came forward with their budget today. Um, the one thing in both of these budgets, neither one of them embraced your half-cent uh, mm -hmm. sales tax increase. Is that dead? Well, I don't know that it's dead. The question I think they're asking themselves now is now that they have this new income, and in fact, not just the $100 million in the revenue and $333 million in the enrollments, but they also, because of the passage of the extension on the tax and the extension on unemployment benefits by Congress this past week, had that been known by our forecaster, we probably would see another $100 million. So in light of that, uh, they've both been able to find a path forward without looking um, outside for a ballot measure. All four corners, Republicans and Democrats alike, are looking for more revenue that they can pass, sometimes with a, a two-thirds vote. They're still ready to do that in some instances, some tax loopholes, for example. So the combination of those things, I think, will allow them uh, to be able to move forward if they choose not to go to the ballot. I didn't have a choice. I didn't have that money available to me. So I had to make a proposal that was very difficult for me, but I could not tolerate the cuts to education we were going to have to make to our developmentally disabled and senior citizens and public safety. You mentioned to me that uh, a former governor uh, had actually encouraged you to make that a full penny. You know, uh, it's interesting. If I was to ask the average person on the street in Washington State, when's the last time the state raised the sales tax? I think they'd probably say yesterday. And then if I said, <laughs> when was the time before that? They'd say the day before. I, in fact, it was 1983. 1983, uh, Governor John Spellman. A Republican. Republican, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, worst recession until this one actually raised the sales tax by one full penny. Uh, and uh, as tough as it was, he said he had to do it. He, too, could not see making the cuts that he was having to make. So when I made my proposal, uh, he came forward and, and supported it and said he could understand I was in the exact same spot in a much worse recession than what he confronted, so revenue had to be on the table and had to be considered. When you think of a state like Arizona, as conservative as it is, it, ra it just raised its sales tax by a full penny. Mm. I mean, I think people see the cuts, see the results, know what it means, and say, as tough as it is, 
we've got to do something. We can't just sit here and let this happen. But we've been able to get some good news that may avoid that. I want to go back to that half cent sales tax and uh, whether it's dead, alive, life support or what. Isn't it pretty clear now that it isn't going to be, that legislators aren't going to say, okay, let's adopt this and put it before the voters? I don't, I don't see them doing that right now, but I, you know, I never say never in the legislature, to be perfectly honest with you. So uh, again, they've gotten you know, $433 million I didn't have. My entire half penny would have raised $494. Um, and they're going to raise some revenue that I independently couldn't, that I recommended to them to consider. So they're going to be able to find new monies equal to or greater than what I had at my disposal. All right. A reminder uh, for those of you that are watching tonight and also listening on the radio out there, the number to call to uh, ask the governor is 1-800-258-6463. Again, that's 1-800-258-6463. Another email question, and this one comes uh, from uh, Kent from Grandview over in central Washington. He asks, I'm concerned about the one-size-fits-all approach to raising revenues. With the principle of equal sacrifice as seen with property taxes on the county level, can't our state lawmakers extend this principle to some of their measures for revenue so that people on fixed incomes or who are near or below the poverty level aren't disproportionately taxed? So the, the issue is, is the sales tax a regressive tax? The answer to that is yes. No question about it. So that's why I struggled in whether we should even consider raising the sales tax. But let me just tell you, I think the cuts that I was looking at are really regressive. And I realize that when you take the kind of cuts that we were considering in education and our developmentally disabled, our senior citizens, public safety, I believe those would disproportionately hit our lower income people. So we have to have money as soon as possible. We had to have something that we could implement readily you don't look at very many options when those are your criteria. Sales tax was the one that I felt I had to go to. I could raise it. Uh, we could put it in place by the 1st of July. We could avoid a lot of cuts. And a lot of, uh, I think, really draconian kinds of things that would happen to our lower income people. So I, I agree with what he's saying. Uh, but the voters made it very clear when they said we won't tax uh, the high income earners in the state uh, they just did that, as I recall, here a little over a year ago. Uh, they didn't want to do that. So you, you, you have to, I have to listen to the voters as well. All right. Let's go to uh, Ellensburg and Garrett. Garrett, you're on the air with the governor. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, Hi. Good evening. Um, I was just wondering um, what your thoughts on legalizing marijuana in the state is and what that could do for the um, budget cuts and revenue streams that you've been talking about so far. And that's going to be Initiative 502 that will be on the ballot for sure this year and likely coupled with the possibility of a referendum on same-sex marriage. It's going to be an interesting ballot. Right. So to Garrett, I would say he's assuming that if we legalize marijuana, we will tax it and then we'll get all this money into the state coffers. Uh, until, of course, the federal government comes in and arrests us. <laughs> so I don't think that's going to work out very well for us. Still under federal law, it is a crime. Uh, marijuana use is a crime. And we've seen our U.S. attorneys come in and take actions over the course of the last year, making it very clear that they were not going to use their enforcement power for those who were using it for medicinal purposes. But for anybody else, they were going to use their arrest power, and they did, and they did. So. Uh, I don't think we can get in the business of taxing and, and getting revenue off uh, marijuana and think that's going to solve our problem. So I take it by what you're saying there, you're not going to be voting for Initiative 502. I'm not. I, you know, this is, I made it clear I want to do something for those who need medicinal marijuana. I understand that. I want to make it so that those folks don't have to think of themselves as a criminal uh, conduct themselves like they think they're acting like they're, they're doing something illegal. I want them to be able to go to a pharmacy with a prescription and get it filled. And that's why I submitted a petition to the federal government uh, to ask them to reclassify marijuana, reclassify it as a drug like opiates, which are much more harmful, 
uh, and allow patients, legitimate medicinal marijuana patients, to have access legally to their prescription at a local pharmacy. Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that's going to happen. Going beyond that, Enrique, we will be in violation of federal law and we will invite them to come in and exercise their police power. Other governors have joined you on this. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, Rhode Island, what are the states? How many others? Um, there are about three states, but it's interesting what's happening. The medical community is now supporting, uh, in large part, uh, many mayors, and it's going to be taken up at their national meeting. Uh, our legislature passed a resolution in support. So it's really gathering uh, a good head of, of steam. They now have written me uh, and accepted the petition. Uh, they have to go through their certain tests and is so that on. The Department of Justice, that, or who it is, is that? but it's it has to. They have to then consult with the Department of Health and Human Services for the testing of the of the the drug because it has to be done objectively. Can it really be used to relieve pain and so on? Uh, and I'm I'm really guardedly optimistic we're going to be successful there. It'll be the first time that anybody's ever asked it to be reclassified to the category I have. First time it's ever come from a governor. Uh, so I, I'm optimistic that we're going to get some help. All right, let's go to Everett and uh, Tariq or Tarek. Uh, you're on the air with the governor. Go ahead. Hello there. Hi. Um, how are you tonight? Good. Oh, I'm a, a student at the University of Washington, and I am uh, currently trying to pursue computer science and engineering. Um, I'm on the dean's list at the university, um, but I still couldn't get in. Uh, that's because of the limited funding, um, as highlighted in a recent Seattle Times article. And this is affecting many different departments in the, in the university. And so I wanted to know what, what are you proposing to raise funding, not just for UW, but for other schools in the region? Well, um, the truth be known, we allowed um, tuition flexibility. So the University of Washington, um, in the legislation that was passed last year, has raised their tuition now, as you probably are aware, um, by 20 percent. Uh, they remain very competitive with like uh, research universities around the country, um, but still, that's a stiff uh, increase in tuition for people to be able to attend the University of Washington. So they've been able to keep their enrollments up. They have not cut enrollments. They've been able to keep their quality up. But we have far too many of our students who really want to get into the UW or any of our other universities and not being able to find room. So we need to increase capacity overall. We did in my first term, probably one of the largest increases in history. We created the UW Tacoma four-year school and WSU Tri-Cities and WSU Vancouver. Uh, all of which brought us a whole lot more students. We're going to expand now in Everett. Um, so that's all good news, but without the ability to find new revenue, uh, and I don't think we can raise tuition anymore. I think we're done. Uh, I think we've gone as far as we can. Without the ability to find new revenue, we do not have any resource to put into uh, our higher education institutions. This seems kind of a contradiction. On one hand, um you hear business leaders and yourself and other lawmakers all say that we need uh, a great higher education system in this state. We need to support it. On the other hand, funding has continually been cut for higher ed. Tuitions have gone up. Uh, universities now have that opportunity to raise those tuitions up. Uh, where's the give here? So remember now, um, the legislature and myself have been steadfast on the state need grant. That's to help our low-income students. There have been no cuts, and in fact, it's been increased. And if a university chooses to increase its tuition, it has to make sure that it contributes to that state need grant for those students as well. We created an opportunity scholarship program. Our first two contributors to that program were Microsoft and Boeing, 25 million each. Over time, the state will match that. That's intended to get at that middle income student whose parents can't afford the full and are not eligible for the state need grant and are getting squeezed out. So unless and until, however, we find some steady long-term source of funding for higher education, we're not going to be able to put more money in. They have been able to succeed over the last three years because they've made up for the cuts that we took with increased tuition but they have not been able to gain. 
we need to be able to gain we need to have greater access to higher education and no loss of quality the you dub is ranked for example the sixteenth best research university in the world in the world um, w s u is considered one of the finest uh... in the country um, look around at our regional universities we are we are blessed in this state to have the diversity that we do and our community and technical colleges are considered among the best we can't afford to give that up that's why we're the home of so many international companies because we provide that kind of education but we're going to have to ask for some help and if not a tax on high income earners which was turned down by the voters then what we need to ask ourselves what are we the citizens of the state of washington willing to do to invest in our k through twelve system and invest in our higher education system because it's really up to us now all right let's go to yakima and a question from annie annie you're on the air with the governor Good evening, Governor. Hi, Annie. I am a volunteer facilitator for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and I'm finding that people that come to my groups are having more and more trouble getting services from community resources because of the federal and state funding cuts. Do you have any ideas how we can restore that kind of funding? Because people are ending up in places like Eastern when before they were taking advantage of less costly resources such as the community resources well no question uh... now we have tried to avoid cuts in mental health but what we've not been able to do is enhance funding for mental health and when you take a cut it this is one of those situations where it goes downstream it befalls our locals to be able to come up with the resources so uh, again unless and until we can be on the path to recovery with additional dollars coming in we're not going to be able to restore or enhance uh services for those suffering from mental illness in the state i want to i want to be clear about one thing uh, before i go further about talking about restoring we now have uh just as we came into the legislative session a new supreme court decision on funding in basic education and the court our state supreme court makes clear that the legislation that was passed here a couple of years ago is good it sets the right course it makes the right decisions it now has to be fully funded and we've got a very limited amount of time in which we can meet the requirement of the court to fully fund our plan so if a dollar came in tomorrow unexpectedly it's going to have to go into basic education. We now have oversight by our state Supreme Court to make sure that we're coming into full compliance with that decision. But let's talk about that because the House budget that came out today, the Democrats' House budget, um, I guess by some are looking at it is that it's kind of kicking the can down the road here because some of the money that should go to pay for some public education, uh, uh, the system is being pushed. It, what they want to do is delay it in order to uh, be able to then uh, save more money, I guess, in the budget. Isn't that what's really happening here? And is that really the, going to help meeting that mandate? That doesn't seem so. There's no money. Candidly, there's no money to do it. Uh, they, they restored the cuts to, I was, I was suggesting that we're going to have to not have a full school year cut four days. The court said you can't do that. Didn't say it directly, but that's clearly what the court meant. So they ha that's a hundred million. Levy equalization was a hundred and fifty million. Uh, that's to help our property poor, but it's about eighty-five percent of the districts. That was not cut. Uh, higher education, there was a hundred and sixty million dollars in cuts. They restored all but about seventy million of that. And so you can see they're using up all of the new money that they found, and they still have cuts to make. So. What they've proposed is there's a payment made at the end of the biennium, the last month of the biennium, and they propose delaying it one day, which would mean it would be the beginning of the next biennium. We did it last time. I proposed it in my budget, so I want to take responsibility for this. But what I proposed is we put it in the reserve. So if we don't use the reserve, we pay for it. Mm -hmm. And only if it's not available do we then have to pay it the first day of the next biennium. And is that hoping that the economy then changes a bit more to well because they're aware that they're going to get a better forecast at least it looks now uh, of a hundred million dollars in june so they feel 
more confident even than I did that we won't touch the reserve and it will be able to make that payment. We need to be careful about that. I admit to you, Enrique, you can't kick the can down the road. You can't leave us with a bill that we have to pay day one of the next biennium. Uh, but I just I, I don't think they feel that they can make any more cuts, particularly to education, with that case sitting before them. All right. I want to uh, go to Marysville and take a call from Ralph. And go ahead, Ralph. You're on the air with the governor. Hello, uh, Governor. I'm, I haven't been a fan for years. I've never voted any other way but Democrat. I'm very concerned about about the homosexuality and and marriage between a man, and, uh, two women or two men. I think I've, I've, I was taught the birds and bees, and I think that uh, the for my parents, I think they they were they understood how it was, how it is. And I think no matter how much a sex change or or whatever person goes through, that they're still a man is still a man, no matter what he does or how, how he dresses. And I believe that uh, I don't. I support having uh, a legal partnership between any your sis, two sisters or brothers or uncles, but to to uh, to to, to uh, change marriage uh, to and and change call it something else. It just doesn't seem right. right? And maybe you can explain how how you understand that. Well, I, you know, I can tell you how I've come to understand uh, my own personal journey uh, and where I've come from. I, I'm, I'm a person of faith, and my faith um, really doesn't uh, embrace same-sex marriages. You're Catholic. I'm Catholic. So I have struggled with this until finally I realized, um, after having listened to my daughters, uh, and her, our, our, both our daughters' generation make it very clear they don't understand how my generation can discriminate. But I looked, frankly, at the role of the state of Washington. And the state of Washington doesn't marry anybody. The state of Washington gives you a license to marry. You actually go out from there and you can go to a judge, you can go to a priest, you can go to whoever by law is authorized to marry, and that's how you marry. So how is it then the state is allowed to deny a license to marry to a couple because of sexual orientation? I could not accept that any longer. And when I know there are very loving couples who are raising children, who are integral parts of our community, who are part of our faith community, who are contributing the betterment of our state of Washington, and to say to them that somehow the state was not going to view them as equal to another couple, to say to their children, your parents are different, they are less, they are what, whatever, I can't explain that to those children. I just can't. So I have struggled with this. I admit that. Uh, I've been on my own personal journey. But I have reached a conclusion where, and I made it very clear in the bill, we will honor and we will respect religious freedom in the state of Washington. By m I must honor and respect the role of the state cannot be to discriminate against a same-sex couple who are asking for a license to go from there and to get married. So uh, I respect if you disagree, but I tell you I feel better about where I am today than I have felt about where I have been the last seven years. Uh, and I think it's right. Uh, if you could see the emails that I've received, a 16-year-old who said she thought about suicide and then she realized that I had said she was to be re respected and accepted as an equal person in the state of Washington, had made such a difference in her life. When you get those kind of emails and you know how thirsty our people in this state are for equality, that's who we are. That's what we're about. I respect and I admire and I love every human being in the state of Washington. That's my faith. I, as governor, cannot see the state discriminating when it issues a license to marry. So I'm proud of what we did in the legislature. I'm glad that we were the seventh state in the country. If it goes to the ballot, I hope the people of the state of Washington will stand up for equality and send a message across the country. We, the state of Washington, believe in the respect of each of our citizens. And if it goes to the ballot, I take it you will be out there um, trying to preserve your decision? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, we were the first state in the country uh, to have the voters say yes to domestic partnership. And we've been, we've been on our own journey as a state, Enrique. 
Uh, we had fought for anti-discrimination law, anti-discrimination law, for how many years? And finally, we were able to do it in 2006. Then a very small domestic partnership in 2007, expanded in 2008, voted on by the voters in 2009. We've been on our own journey. Uh, we've come to realize there are people at our, our work, there are friends, there are neighbors. They are our sons, they are our daughters, they are our moms, and they are our dads. If you could have heard the speeches on the floor of the House and the Senate, Republican and Democratic alike, alike thoughtful, respectful, but saying that they had found, for example, in one instance, their daughter had come out uh, two years ago, that she'd found the love of her life and that mother wanted to put a wedding on for her daughter. Another who found that his father had been discriminated against terribly when he came out and recognized that he was gay. These are people who say, please, let our loved ones be recognized. Let them be seen as equal. Let them be able to express their love in front of their family and friends. Take a vow of marriage. Let them be a family. Let's take another phone call now. Let's go to uh, Marysville and Susan. Susan, you're on the air with the governor. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, my only income <laughs> is Social Security, and I'm also on Medicare and Medicaid. And this year, the federal government gave all of us on Social Security a cost of living raise. And because I'm on Medicaid, the state took the entire cost of living increase. It's not a raise, it's an increase. And so I was wondering, now that the state has some money, are we going to be able to get any of that um, cost of living increase back? Because food is outrageously expensive, as you know. I do. I do. I understand what you're saying. Um, we, didn't, we can't take your cost of living, so I'm not sure, candidly, how this has impacted you, what cuts there might have been that have impacted you, other than the inflation costs of gas or the inflation cost of, of medications maybe that you're having to take or, um, you know, taxes or I don't know what it is specifically with respect to you. But everybody who's been cut in the state budget believes now that we've got a dollar in the door that that dollar needs to go to whatever cut impacted them the most. When in fact we've cut ten and a half billion, ten and a half billion We've gotten in the door in the last two weeks 433 million. 433 million. You can't restore $10.5 billion in cuts with $43 million. And it's very clear that the state has a, now a legal obligation under our state constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court. That first dollar, the second dollar, and the third dollar has got to go to basic education in the state. So. I, I can't speak to your circumstances. I don't understand it by how you've described it. But I sure hope, uh, I'll tell you, that the future, our economy will turn around. I can see really good indications and that we'll be able to ensure that you get a COLA and you keep your COLA. State Senator Karen Kaiser has suggested selling the state's art collection to raise money that then would go to a higher ed. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, <laughs> I... I you know, one, I don't know that you're going to be able to sell it. Let me just say that. Uh, we have property. We have property in the state because we've closed down uh, several prisons. We've closed down a juvenile institution. We've closed down a DD uh, institution. We've closed down more institutions than at any time in history. The last big institution was when Dan Evans was governor. So we put all that up for sale. Uh, and I've had it up for sale for some time, but I made it clear it's not a fire sale. The taxpayers are deserving of getting return on, on those buildings, and they, in, some of them are in prime locations. Guess how many we've sold? Zero. Zero. We're sitting in an economy now where people are not willing to spend, I suspect, on artwork or on a building or on a piece of property like they were a few years ago. So I don't know, and I, I'm a big fan of the senators, I don't know that it works, but I'm also very reluctant to start selling off our heritage, and I think the art collection the state has is a part of our fundamental heritage. I want my children and my grandchildren to inherit a state who has kept its heritage and passed it on into generations, so I hope we don't resort to this. 
Let's take another phone call here. Let's go to uh, Stephen in Bellingham. Stephen, you're on the air with the governor. Go ahead. Hi, Governor Gregoire. It's a privilege to speak with you. Hi, Stephen. Uh, you know, I'll make this as succinct as possible. A little background. In February of 2011, SSA Marine, which is 49% owned by Goldman Sachs, applied to the state and the county of Whatcom for a permit to build a port, an export terminal. It would become the largest export terminal in the entire United States. And at about the same time, they announced they had a, a contract with Peabody Coal to export 24 million tons of coal per year to Asia. Uh, as, as you know, this has become a huge controversy for us in Bellingham. Okay. But not just in Bellingham, all along the corridor. People are concerned about the rail traffic, uh, the coal dust, and the effects on the environment. And also to us in Bellingham, we're very concerned about the impact this will have on the development of our waterfront. Uh, briefly, I know that you supported this project uh, initially. You have since mm -hmm. taken a step back and said it can't be reduced to a simple argument of you know, jobs versus the environment. Given the outcry over this project, I'm wondering where you stand now and how you see your role uh, for the remainder of your tenure as governor. So I, I never took a position on, on the facility at all. Uh, what was being asked is whether we would serve as co-lead as we went through the environmental review process. And we agreed at the request of the locals there to do precisely that. So as we do with anybody else who's asking for a permit, we're going to put it through the environmental review process. And we have to do it absolutely by the book. So that's the process we're in now. I will not prejudge it, uh, and I am not going to get involved in it. I want it to be an objective scientific review. Uh, and so that's what we're engaged in now. I have never taken a position for or against it. All right, let's go to uh, Carl in Kent. Carl, you're on the air with the Governor. Good evening, Governor. Alan Enrique. Good, Hi. good evening. Hi, Carl. Uh, concerning the Mud Mountain Dam, and I live in Kent, uh, is there any problem with the Mud Mountain Dam and possible uh, flooding in the valley? Thanks for taking my question. Have a good evening. Yeah, yeah. you bet. Thank you. Um, so we've been very worried about it, uh, but we were able to work with the Army Corps of Engineers put in some fix, and I, I don't know of any reason now for you to be concerned. Uh, it, would it would have to be a, a catastrophic flood, to be honest with you, because the problems that we detected here a couple of years ago, we had an initial fix. We've gone on to make sure it was fully done. We worked with our congressional delegation and the Army Corps of Engineers and the local government there and have been able to do that. So uh, at this point in time, I feel, I feel good about where we are. Again, uh, Mother Nature can can give us a twist here and give us a turn that we don't anticipate. But absent something uh, unpredictable by us right now, I'm feeling good about where we are. All right, let's take another email question here from John in Blaine. Why hasn't our state done away with daylight savings time? <laughs> Studies show that sleep deprivation in the week following the switch costs $480 million in lost productivity. Actually, I'm kind of with him on this. I have one of those sleep lamps, you know, or those lamps, those light lamps, because it's so dreary and dark here half the time. So, anyway. Uh, the questions never come before me, to be honest with you, as governor. Um, well, that's why you come here. Yes, to exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, you know, and I think, actually, I think there are people who look forward to it, uh, to get a little bit of more. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I'm not sure that's, you know, I don't know what the people of the state of Washington would say. Um, but I'm sure there'd be a good number of them that would say, I don't, know, don't, you don't change sleep it. anyway, the way yeah, things yeah, have been yeah, going right. lately. Lately. So lately. I take it that you doesn't that really right. matter. But I, I like the question anyway. Let's take another phone call here. Let's go, to, uh, uh, let's go to Ted here in Seattle. Go ahead, Ted. You're on the air with the governor. Oh, good evening, Governor. Hi, Ted. I have a question about the who's running the, at the helm of a good ship at UW. Uh, I see a massive construction pro program going on. They tore down the brick dorms, were beautiful dorms, less than 20 years old. They trashed those. They're building the new stadium. There's construction going all over the university, and I thought their mandate was to educate and and to provide uh, opportunities for these all the people that that are qualified to get an upward uh, education. 
All right, let's so have, it have you looked into this massive construction program that's costing it, it costs a lot less to educate these students than to build these, this incredible building program? So I think it was Ted. Um, yeah. Ted, uh, is I, as I understand it, the reconstruction of the stadium, Husky Stadium, is done by private donation. Uh, and I want to give a shout out also to WSU. Uh, they have done the same thing over there, but they've done it again with private donation. Uh, the UW looked to the state, and we, we frankly said it was several years ago that we didn't have the financial re resources to help out. So they began a campaign to ask their alums if they'd be willing to step up, and they did. And so out of that, I think there's going to come a, a really classy stadium, but it will not be done with state taxpayers' money. All right, let's take another call here. Let's go to Ann in Everett. Hi, Ann. You're on the air with the governor. Thank you. Thank you for taking my call. Um, Governor Gregoire, I'm interested in teacher evaluation, mm -hmm. and um, as you know, we already have a teacher evaluation system that's being developed. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about legislation to develop a second system that includes student test scores and student evaluations of teachers. Now, how much more is this going to cost, and where is the money going to come from for that second system? So this is a little bit longer question. Um, two years ago, we put in place a new evaluation system to be built from the bottom up. And this was to be really a coordination by teachers and administrators uh, and to be looked to as uh, best practices that we saw around the country, experts that we brought in around the country. And I, I have to tell you, uh, Enrique, it has far exceeded anybody's expectation because the teachers have worked hard, the schools have worked, the administrators have worked hard, and they've come up with an evaluation system that I think is a model for the country. It, it, it replaces a system that had satisfactory and unsatisfactory. That's not fair to teachers. An evaluation is a tool to give people personal growth so they can get better at what they do, get better outcomes for our students. So out of this is a four-tiered system uh, in terms of evaluation, eight different criteria. What was before the legislature this year was, okay, let's take it to scale all across the state because it's been so successful in the pilots. And are we, good, are we gonna use student data a as a part of it? So yes, student data will be used in three of the eight criteria. It's being used in, in the pilots in at least three of the eight criteria, as I understand it. So we've taken what we've learned from the pilots and we're putting it in place now. But the question that was raised is a good one. How do we make it work? You have to teach and train the principals to do a good job in order for the teachers to grow through the evaluation. So we are gonna spend money on the training. We're gonna spend money on training so that when we evaluate principals, the same thing. The goal here is a simple one. We want to make sure that teachers and principals are allowed to grow because we want the best teacher in front of the classroom, the best principal in front of the school, and if we can get these evaluations right, we think we can make that happen. Let me be clear. Others who won the Race to the Top award decided that they would do evaluations from the top down, and they are failing as we speak, failing as we speak. You don't do that without people working together. And it means those who are all teaching math in the fifth grade may come together and collectively be part of an evaluation because they're partners and they're sharing in, in doing things and growing as they do. Our national board certified teachers are unbelievably doing well. We want to make sure we recognize that. So we want to give shout outs to teachers who are doing great. We want to take those who are not and get them to grow and take those who simply should not be teaching to see for themselves it's not their field and that they should move on and do something else because our kids really ought to have the best teacher and the best principal they can. Uh, another email question here. This is from Roger in Richland. Why do we provide any benefits for undocumented people, children or otherwise, when we are cutting funding to aid documented people that are in need? So if he's talking about, if Roger's talking about health care, which I assume he is, um, we, don't, we don't check whether somebody is the child of an undocumented or a documented. We don't. Uh, as best said by doctors, that they don't want to be the Border Patrol. 
Um, children who are here are here not because they made some choice in life and decided what they would do. They were here, they're here because their parents brought them here. And if they're here, we feel that they ought to have access to health care. So uh, I, I accept uh, this as the responsibility of the state to make sure that all of our children have access to health care and that we don't serve as the Border Patrol to check them whether they have documentation or not. I want to go back on uh, the question about uh, that you just answered uh, uh, from the previous caller. Uh, you had, uh, in your State of the State address, you, you had four things that you wanted from lawmakers. Mm -hmm. You know, one was to pass the budget. Um, the other one was your sales tax increase, which probably isn't going to happen. Um, the other being... That would be nice if it didn't, by the way. <laughs> yeah. It's not necessarily a loss okay. if we had new revenue. Um, two things. Uh, one is education reform. Mm -hmm. uh, of what you wanted, are you getting that in, out of this session? We are. Here's, here's what I ask. I ask for evaluations, uh, and we brought in four corners, we call them. So I had a Republican and Democrat from the House and the Senate, Senator Litzow, Senator McAuliffe, Representative Litton, Representative Dammeyer, and we sat at the table hour after hour, day after day, and we reached an agreement on what would be the right thing to do in evaluations. They were thoughtful. They were good faith in their negotiations. They respected the pilot projects. They wanted to make sure this worked, and I, I, my hat goes off to them because I think we did a very good job. Second one is, is higher education governance, and that bill is moving through. Part of that bill is going to make sure that when our students graduate from high school, that they transition easily into, into college. We're losing far too many students who are coming out of high school uh, ready to take um, remedial, remedial courses. They need to come out, and that high school diploma needs to mean something. So we're doing well there. And then the last idea is what we call the lab school. For those schools that are struggling academically, how do we do something innovative? So we're going to take our institutions of higher education, our schools of education, who are going to go into one of those schools, kind of adopt that school. They're going to be responsible for the school. They're, I hope, going to be able to show us how to turn it around. They're going to be able to better teach their own teachers going out of our colleges of education. Uh, I think it's one of the most significant and interesting, exciting reforms we've come up with in a long time. The other thing that you had asked for is that you wanted this major transportation bill. Now, as I understand it, uh, uh, the Senate Transportation Committee, in a bipartisan effort, has come up with something. Mm -hmm. uh, is it what you wanted? No, not at all. Not enough money? No, not at all. Um, over, over the next 10 years, we need, at minimum, about $3.7 billion, uh, about $360 million a year, uh, for maintenance and operation of our highways, bridges, and ferries for the state and for local governments. Uh, we don't have a steady, reliable source of funding for our maintenance and operation of transportation in the state of Washington. We've done these new projects. We've done them on time and under budget. That's great, but now we need to maintain them. Failing to maintain is much more costly in the long haul than it is if you just maintain along the way. So, so are you going to push gonna, for more there, or what? We're going to kick the can down the road, unfortunately. Um, I think Senator Haugen and uh, Representative Cliburn have tried, uh, and there's, there's just not an appetite to get it done this session. So they're using it as an opportunity to educate so that everybody understands the consequences if we don't invest in maintenance and operation. I put together a task force, about 30-some people statewide. Number one priority, you've got to invest in maintenance and operation. So uh, I hope we've got to put a down payment, educate, and get there in the next year or two. About 30 seconds here. I just want you to answer this quickly. What do you see as anything that could potentially derail the lawmakers from getting done by March 8th? Um, we've got some tough bills that are very contentious that we don't have resolution on yet. And then, of course, we could have something very, very unlikely, I hope, happen in Europe where Greece would default or Italy or Spain, and that would put us back to ground zero again. All right. Uh, that's all the time that we have tonight with the governor. But if you had a question and the governor wasn't able to get, uh, you weren't able to get through to talk to the governor tonight, here's how you can still ask your question. The governor's number is 360-902-4111. 
That's 360-902-4111. You could also write her at P.O. Box 40002, Olympia, Washington, 98504-002. Or you could go online to governor.wa.gov. And I'd like to thank the governor for answering questions tonight. I'd also like to thank all of our, fo our fellow public television stations, as well as Northwest Public Radio for broadcasting tonight's show. And thanks to our studio audience for standing by and uh, listening to all of the uh, questions that were asked and uh, getting the answers from the governor. I'm Enrique Cerna. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Local production of Ask the Governor is made possible in part by First Choice Health. Proud to continue our ongoing support of Ask the Governor as a founding underwriter. At First Choice Health, we recognize that healthy employees make healthy companies. First Choice Health.